you. Um, so we're going to get started. So our presentation tonight is going to be on designing distance learning spaces for success um, using different sensory strategies. So um, I'm Trisha Park, um, and I'm going to be uh, presenting, speaking, and then Christina Pandolfo, the other occupational therapist, she's going to be in the chat. So if anyone has any questions, um, you know, you can't unmute yourself. So we're going to have to type it into the chat and then Christina can type back and answer them for you. Um, and then we'll also have time um, either there's a break in the between and then time at the end to answer questions as well. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so our first slide is what is occupational therapy? Um, so occupational therapy or OT is a practice that helps people with activities of daily living. Um, so as an OT, you know, I can work in many different settings. Obviously, schools is one place that I work in. And then, uh, you know, we can work in hospitals, things like that. Um, so when we say activities of daily living, what we mean by that for students in schools is that um, th these are activities that uh, students have to do every day at school. So things like handwriting, scissor skills, typing. And then, of course, we also look at sensory processing, which is going to be a big part of our presentation tonight. Okay, so on our next slide, we'll go over what is sensory processing. So sensory processing is the way that our body takes in and then interprets information from our environment using our different senses. So things like, you know, how we touch, see, smell things. Um, but not everyone interprets these different sensory sensations or information the same way. So what we mean by interpret is that not everyone kind of feels these different sensory stimuli coming in differently. So the example we have on screen here is, you know, perfume that may smell really great to the student over here. This student down here thinks it's pretty smelly. So they're interpreting it or feeling it in a different way. Another example of this would be, you know, if a, an ambulance drives by that may make, you know, my friend cover her ears and she's, you know, in a lot of pain because it's too loud, but I'm not bothered by it. So we're all, you know, experiencing these different sensations in different ways. Okay, so we have, like I said before, we have kind of all of our senses that we're very familiar with, the five senses of hearing, vision, touch, smell, taste, and then we have two extra senses that we as occupational therapists also look at. So one of them being vestibular, which is the way our body detects how we move through space. And this is using our, the organs in our inner ear to detect this. So they can detect how we're moving forward, backward, up and down. And then we also have our proprioceptive system, which is the deep pressure input on the joints of our body. So um, these two are more internal um, that we look at. And then we actually use these pretty often as well um, because vestibular, that movement input and deep pressure often help calm and organize the body and get us ready for learning. All right. So next we're gonna go over, like we were talking about before, everyone interprets sensory information in different ways. So some people can be very overly responsive or very sensitive to sensory input. And some people are more under responsive or need to seek out more sensory input. So I'll go over some examples of those. So on this first page, we have you know, some common examples of being very overly responsive or sensitive to sensory input would be picky eaters. So, no, so our oral sensory sense, that taste and texture. Some kids, you know, certain textures or tastes are too strong and they're very sensitive and so they don't want to eat them. And, you know, everyone has different foods that they like and dislike. So again, another way that our bodies kind of interpret this information a little differently. Another example, like the one, same as the one we used before, some people are very overly responsive or sensitive to certain sounds or loud noises. And, you know, they're the people that need to cover their ears. Whereas me or others may not need to cover their ears when we hear the school bell, ambulance, drive by, things like that. So those are some examples of being sensitive to sensory input or overly responsive. All right, and then on our next page, we have some examples of what it means to be under response. Yeah. Sorry, can you slow down for our translators? Just a oh bit? yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay, so 
some examples of being under responsive or seeking out more sensory input um, would be using the tactile system or our touch sense. Um, you know, we often see kids who are fidgeting around with their clothing, they're touching at the computer a lot, maybe touching, you know, toys when they should be paying attention to their Zoom class. We like, I like to give the nickname to these students, you know, our octopus kids, they're just constantly reaching out to touch different things. And so because they're not feeling that touch sense the same way that most people would, they're not getting enough of that input, they need to seek out more in order to fulfill and, you know, feel more self-regulated. Um, another example using that vestibular system or the movement system is children who are constantly on the move. So kids who are often wiggling around in their chair or, you know, even have a difficult time even just remaining seated during their classes, things like that. Again, they're seeking out that movement because they're not getting enough of it. They're not feeling enough of it. And then we'll, our last example, we'll use um, the proprioceptive system or that deep pressure system that we feel on our joints and muscles. Um, these are students who you know, move objects very roughly because they're not able to feel how much pressure they're putting on an object. So maybe they push in their chair and it's a little too hard and it bangs against their desk. Or these are also students who really enjoy that rough and tumble play and wrestling with siblings or other peers. They're seeking out that really deep pressure input. And so the photo that we've used here is um, actually someone squeezing a stress ball. So really seeking that deep pressure input. So that's um, just kind of a brief explanation of what it means to be overly or underly responsive or using the other two terms being either very sensitive or seeking out sensory input. Okay, so kind of the point of why we're here tonight, how does this impact learning? So when you have these different sensitivities or seeking behaviors to different sensory stimuli, it can affect a student's overall attention to different tasks. And ultimately, you know, if they're not paying attention, that can affect how they're learning. So for example, um, you know, a child who is very distracted by background noises or is um, sensitive to background noise, maybe they're kind of turning around and listening to what's going on on the TV or mom or dad cooking dinner rather than on their Zoom classes like they should be. You know, it can make it difficult to pay attention. Um, you know, same thing with those seeking behaviors. If a child is seeking a lot of movement, you know, having a hard time sitting still, even remaining seated during class, that can have a big impact on their learning. All right, so what we do to help students with these different sensory processing difficulties is as OTs will often use sensory strategies and environmental modifications to a student's classroom environment in order to accommodate that student's specific needs. Okay, we'll stop here really quick and give a little time if people have questions that they want to put in the chat. Okay, I'll just take like, where's my phone? I'll take like one minute. We'll just wait and see if anyone has questions. And then um, of you're course also sorry, I'm Trish. I just wanted to also say that they have the option of raising their hand and we can have them unmute if they feel um, more comfortable asking their questions, if that's okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. But yeah, we'll also have time at the end for questions as well. Um, so I'll just give it a teeny bit more time and then we'll in the next slides, I'll be going over each sensory system and then the common strategies that we use for each one and how you can modify, you know, give these, you know, use these strategies with your student at home or modify their learning environment at home while we're doing distance learning. All right, so it's been about a minute. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. But like I said, we will have time at the end as well 
where like um, Rachel is saying, you can raise your hand, unmute yourself and ask questions, or you can continue putting them in the chat and Christina is monitoring that. Okay, no, there we go. Okay, so we're gonna start off with the auditory strategies and modifications. And just to review, the auditory system has to do with hearing. Um, so one common strategy we use with kids who are very sensitive or very distracted by a lot of noise happening in the background is we'll often suggest noise canceling headphones um, to use when completing classwork or homework off of the computer. We do not suggest these um, to be used while the child needs to be either listening to the teacher or collaborating with peers. These are only to be used when they're doing work by themselves and maybe there's a lot going on in the background that they would be distracted by. Um, an option to use when they are, you know, on the computer and have to be listening to the teacher or working with classmates on Zoom is headphones that have a microphone that you plug into the computer. Um, so that is something that we also put a link to headphones like that um, on our resources slide. So we'll take a look at that um, once we get down there, but that is an option as well. And they make some pretty good ones too that do block out a lot of noise. I know a lot of the gaming headphones definitely do that. So that is an option. And then of course, you know, setting up your child's workspace, you know, computer or desk, in a quiet area of the house. So that could be, you know, maybe in their room if they're older, if they're younger and you kind of need to be monitoring what they're doing, you could have them in a corner of your house that's, you know, they can't see the TV, they're not distracted by you working maybe or siblings also on Zoom, things like that. Okay, so we'll head over to our next sensory system. And that is going to be our visual system. So a big problem we've been seeing with students right now is because of the increased screen time, a lot of students are complaining of headaches or their eyes are getting very tired. And so something we can do to help remedy that is they do make blue light glasses. I'm actually wearing a pair right now. Um, that kind of block out that blue light that can really hurt a student's eyes during the day from all the excessive screen time. So there's a little picture down here of a pair. Some of them have an orange tint and some of them are more clear. It just depends on the type that you, um, if you do think your student needs them, it just depends on the type that you decide to get. Um, in addition, very similar to the auditory strategies, is to set up your child's workspace, you know, computer or desk area away from visual distractions like the TV, other siblings or parents working in the room as much as possible. Um, and one way to do that too, if you do have to have your student, you know, your more than one child working in the same room is you could get um, a divider. So it's basically like a cardboard, tri-fold thing that kind of makes their little desk area into a cubicle. And you can even make one out of like, you know, an old Amazon box or, you know, I know they sell the um, presentation tri-fold um, cardboard type things at uh, Office Depot too for like kids when they would do in-class presentations. Um, another common kind of issue that at least I've been seeing with some of the students that I work with is they often get distracted by themselves, like seeing themselves on the Zoom screen, and maybe they're making funny faces, distracting classmates, which isn't exactly what we want them to be doing. So a way to help with that is you can put either a piece of paper with tape or a post-it note over their little picture on the screen. And that can kind of help, you know, with that distractions. They aren't able to see themselves, but they don't have to turn off their camera because we still want them to be par participating and for their teacher to see that they're paying attention during class. So those are the visual strategies. All right, so now we're on to our tactile or strategies that help with the touch system. So with our hands um, and modifications. So, one of the things we often suggest 
for students who are seeking out that tactile or touch input are the use of fidget. Um, and so you can see some picture down in the corner here. There's so many different kinds. I mean, it's Amazon just has so many options these days too that are pretty easy to obtain. Um, but they're great for students who need to do something with their hands in order to attend to their Zoom classes and you know focus on what's happening on screen. So you know, instead of a student messing with the Zoom buttons or playing with toys that may not be appropriate at the time because they should be paying attention to their class, you can try out these different fidgets. They have something to keep their hands busy and they can still pay attention to what their teacher is you know, trying to teach them on the screen. Um, just as a disclaimer though, you know, fidgets aren't supposed to be toys, they're supposed to be tools. And so basically our kind of rule of thumb is that if the novelty, um, as long as the novelty kind of wears off after about 15 minutes and they can still hold the object and attend to their class, that means it's working. But if the child is distracted by the fidget, then it's not an appropriate tool for them. So I know an example I think about a lot is a few years ago, fidget spinners were very popular and I feel like every kid had one. And you know, the kind of, uh, I don't wanna say excuse, but a, a reason for using them that a lot of kids would give is that it helps them pay attention. But it turned out a lot of kids didn't actually need them and it was actually more of a distraction and they were very, you know, distracted during class by the fidget spinner, rather than just using it for something to keep their hands busy. Um, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you do have some kids who are very sensitive to tactile input and they kind of, um, they don't like certain textures or how things feel. So common ones we see in schools are kids who don't like to touch paint, you know, they can't, they don't like having glue on their hands, or even for our younger kids, they get very sensitive to sand. Um, we don't see, you know, in schools, it's like not too common to have this issue. But if your child is very sensitive to certain textures and becomes distressed by having different things on their hands, um, what we usually suggest is to use a tool when um, interacting with the non-preferred touch or texture. So some examples of common tools, you know, with paint, you use a paintbrush rather than your fingers. For glue, I'll often have kids use Q-tips to spread wet glue rather than, um, you know, risk getting it on their hands. And then of course, for sand, there's plenty of different types of tools to use with that, like shovels and different sand toys and such. All right, so mm, our next slide is olfactory strategies and modifications, which is our sense of smell. We don't usually see too many issues with this particular um, sensory system, but um, it does come up every once in a while. So if your child is sensitive to certain smells, you know, just trying not to cook fragrant foods, wear strong perfumes or lotions, or use very strongly smelled household cleaners while they're doing their um, Zoom classes if you think they might be a little bit distracted and not be able to focus if these smells are in the house. But again, this isn't really a sensory system we see a lot of kids having trouble with. Okay, so now we've got some oral sensory strategies and modifications. So again, this is, um, you know, oral sensory includes taste, taste and texture for the most part. Um, we don't, as far as school OT, we don't work on children who are sensitive as much, like those picky eaters or kids who don't like certain textures. That's more of a private OT. That's something they would work on, you know, increasing the amount of food the child will eat and tolerate. But we're, we look more at kids who are seeking out oral sensory input. So kids who are constantly chewing on things is kind of a big one we see actually. So, you know, for a child who chews on clothing, pencils, erasers, other non-food items that can be kind of dangerous, 
Um, we often will suggest, not at school as much with the chewing gum, but we figured we put it on there since we're at home right now. Um, we'll often actually suggest these different chewy tools. So um, in the corner over here, you can see they make, um, they're usually made out of silicone and they make them as necklaces. I know there's bracelets. They also have these cool little pencil topper ones. There's so many different options for chewies these days. And they actually do make quite a few that look like real jewelry as well. So it's a little bit less stigmatizing for a child who needs a lot of this input to wear it at school around their peers. All right. All right, and then we have our last two sensory systems as OTs. These are our two favorites and the, the ones that we use the most often as far as sensory strategies go. So we've got our vestibular strategies and modifications, which again, um, vestibular system focuses on movement and how our body moves through space. Um, so some suggestions we'll often give for students is, especially right now with you know, we're doing a lot more sitting, a lot more time in front of the computer, is we'll suggest that students take more frequent movement breaks, either in between their synchronous Zoom classes, or even if there's like a small break where they're moving from, you know, the big classroom group to their smaller groups where they do math or reading. Those are some great times to fit in, you know, maybe a time to go run around outside a few times or stretch, or even I know a lot of classes will use Go Noodle. You can put on a little yoga video for your child to do just to get some of that movement out before they have to come back and sit down and work again. Um, we'll also often suggest different types of alternative seating. So we have a picture of one up in the corner here that is called a wiggle cushion and it just sits right on top of the child's chair and it's partially inflated so it allows for a bit of movement and the child is able to remain seated. So we'll often suggest this for kids where the movement breaks you know, aren't enough, they need more even during the times when they have to be seated, a wiggle cushion is a great option. There's also a few other seated options that we've listed here. One being a wobble stool, which um, we have a picture of it on the resource page, but it's basically a stool that has a rounded bottom. So it allows for movement as well. And then of course, a yoga ball, which a lot of people have at home <clears throat> is another good option to get that movement while also being able to remain seated and attend to their Zoom classes. All right, and then the last suggestion we put was the use of a TheraBand, which is basically just a big stretchy rubber band that can go around the legs of a student's chair. And so that way they can hook their feet inside and kind of stretch the TheraBand with their legs. Um, we'll often use this for kids who like to kick their legs during class. And you know, we don't really want them at home kicking furniture or kicking things and making a lot of noise. So this is a great option for those students in particular. All right, so our last, our last sensory system, and again, one of the ones that us as OTs like so much and use the most often is our proprioceptive system, which um, for this one, it's strategies that'll give that deep pressure input to the joints and muscles and again, it can help a lot with self-regulation, including calming and increasing that focus so students are ready to learn. <clears throat> so some examples of proprioceptive exercises would be, you know, giving a self-hug because you're squeezing your arms. Yoga is a great one because when you get down, you know, into these different positions, you're putting that pressure and weight on your hands, arms, and your legs. You know, wall push-ups is another good one. Same thing, that pressure on your hands and arms. And then an example of kind of a more fine motor or smaller proprioceptive exercise would be using a stress ball. And a stress ball is great because it also doubles as the child getting that tactile input as well. And then a couple of environmental modifications in this system. Um, 
similar to the vestibular one as well would be TheraBand, again, wrapping around that big rubber band around the chair legs. Um, it, it works for movement and for that deep pressure because it's resistive. So it kind of gives, gives a little bit of pushback, which also puts pressure on the joints of the child's legs. And then same thing with the yoga ball, when they're bouncing on it, you know, their feet are kind of being pushed into the ground. And that's that deep pressure as well. And then I think, yes, that was our last slide. So if there are any questions, should be able to raise our hands or you can put it into the chat and either Christina or I can answer them. And I think while we're waiting for that, I'm just gonna go on to our resource pages. There's quite a few, <laughs> but um, Christina was so great and she actually curated a parent resource folder into Google Drive and it has quite a few different activities that can be used, most especially for those movement and deep pressure systems, the ones that really help with self-regulation. Um, we have quite a few different activities in there. And then I'm gonna just click through because we're gonna send out this PowerPoint after we're done, but there's also a few um, links to some of the different items that we were talking about. So on here, we've got the noise canceling headphones, and then, oh, perfect. Yes, we have our wiggle cushion. And now we can see a picture of our wobble stool. So we've got those two links. We also have the blue blocker glasses and then also the headphones that are not necessarily noise canceling, but they have the microphone that you can use with your computer for the virtual classes. So all of that will be on the PowerPoint that will be sent out after this meeting. And yeah, we just want to say thanks for coming and listening. I know it was a little bit confusing at first, but I'm glad we were able to, you know, get people on and yeah, I hope you enjoyed. And, um, and Trish, I was just going to mention, I mentioned in the chat that um, Dollar Tree is a great place to look for fidgets. They have uh, squeeze balls and stress balls. So I wrote that in the chat, but um, uh, just so our oh, translators yeah. could translate. Um, that. Yeah, and that's perfect. I feel like I get most of my therapy supplies from Dollar Tree at this point, especially the fidgets. They actually have a lot of really great options um, for, you know, the stress balls in particular. They generally have a lot of those. They have a lot of the slime. Yeah, Dollar Tree is definitely a great resource that we use often as occupational therapists. But yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand and we will be here. Hello, so I just wanted to thank everyone again for joining us. Um, we also, um, you're able to unmute to ask questions. If you feel more comfortable asking questions in the space um, publicly, please feel free to do so. Um, I also wanted to um, let you know that you can check in with your child's site um, to see if they have fidgets or other resources available. Um, for you. I know that some sites carry fidgets and other um, sensory um, items in the office. So we don't want um, you to feel that um, you have to go out and purchase these items. If that um, is not something that you're able to do, please check in with your child site as well.
Yes, and often when um, people have questions about these different sensory um, difficulties that children are having, the teacher will often reach out to us, the OTs, and even if it's not a child who, you know, we work directly with, we'll still lend out the equipment if the child needs it. And then we have um, um, a comment in the chat about what about um, lighting in the room? Oh, good question. Um, so it depends on your kiddo. I know some students are very, and you know, thankfully we're at home, so this isn't as much of an issue, but some students are very sensitive to that, um, the flickering light. So trying to reduce that as much as possible. And then, you know, yeah, having good lighting, like Christina said, is important. Um, you know, having a well-lit area, especially when they're working on pa pencil paper tasks, not as much the computer because you can't adjust the brightness. Um, it just needs to be well-lit enough so they can see, but not too bright so that, you know, it's like distracting and they're kind of getting blinded. <laughs> And there's a question um, regarding downloading the packet. Um, so I just added the link to our family learning series. Um, all of the slides and links and um, resources will be added to the family learning series website. Um, so if you click on the link that was just added to the chat, you can find all the information there. It won't be there this evening, but it should be there sometime this week. And then I believe that there is a comment in Spanish, but I am unable to read it. <laughs> it's like um, where uh, we could find the blue blocker glasses. So they are on, uh, we link them in the parent resource um, slide um, and there's a link to Amazon. They're asking if you can paste the link into the chat. Let me see. I think I might have to stop sharing to do that, though. Let me see if I can actually just. And we can stop the screen share so that we can see everyone. If, yeah, let's if we're do done. that. Might be easier. And let me go get the link for that in our PowerPoint here. Okay, so I'm just going to type it in the chat. Ooh, that's a long link. Sorry, guys. 